Welcome to The Endless Nod. You may have noticed recently that there haven't been uh, any main videos, any big videos, and the reason for that is that I've been traveling. First of all, in June uh, I went to VidCon, and in particular uh, participated in EduCon, a special one-day um, session of uh, workshops and so forth for uh, specifically uh, creators of educational content for YouTube, uh, and that was really productive and hopefully uh, there will be some suggestions that I've taken away from that that can improve uh, our videos. Uh, the second trip that I took with the family, this was a, a vacation, not a working trip, was to Iceland and England. Uh, but of course I can't leave etymology completely behind, so along the way I decided to talk about the etymologies of the place names that uh, we visited. And so that's what today's video is all about. So it'll be uh, a bunch of uh, clips taken from traveling with me talking about the place names that we were at, and a little bit about those places. Word of warning, of course, since this was taken on the go, uh, the sound quality varies from time to time. Most of it was filmed outside, so there was, you know, outside noises and wind and so forth. Ho hopefully it's not too bad though. Um, and uh, of course it was just done sort of on the spur of the moment. It wasn't scripted or anything like that. Uh, but hopefully uh, you will enjoy hearing about these place names. Some of them you know, are, are very well-known places, but some of them are also uh, out-of-the-way places that we happen to visit, so they may be quite new to you. Uh, but I think they're all quite interesting. If you want to hear more about uh, these trips uh, and uh, things that we uh, saw along the way and things that we learned, um, check out our podcast, which will be uh, going up uh, towards the end of August. So, of course, our journey started at home here in Sudbury, Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. There wasn't really much here before European colonization. It was only sparsely populated by the Ojibwe people, but not a major center as far as I know. However, when Canada was building the transcontinental um, railway, uh, they discovered that Sudbury was a location containing nickel ore, and so it's because of that that a town really grew up in the area. The name Sudbury obviously comes from the name of a city in back in Europe. So in this case it was Sudbury in England, in the county of Suffolk, which was a small market town. Not particularly well known. However, it happened to be the home of the wife of the superintendent of that stretch of the uh, transcontinental railway. Um, her name was Carolyn, his name James Worthington. And so he selected that name, I guess, in honor of his wife. The British name Sudbury um, is pretty straightforward. Uh, so the Sud part means south, from Old English Sooth. And the second element, bury, um, uh, comes from the word for uh, a fortification, um, and is a common place name element in many uh, British place names, uh, some of which we're going to see a little later on in our trip. So the first stop on our trip was Toronto, since it's much cheaper to fly out of Toronto than Sudbury. So we drove down to Toronto, uh, we spent part of a day there looking at an aquarium, uh, and then flew from there. The name Toronto is an interesting one, as you may well guess. It comes from an indigenous language, though its precise source and meaning are uncertain. The Huron people had been living in the area, but a little later on, as they moved away, the Iroquois moved in. It might therefore come from Huron, meaning meeting place, or it might come from Iroquois, meaning wood in the water, or some other source that we don't know. Once the British colonizers arrived in the region, the British Lord Dorchester arranged for the purchase of these lands in 1787 uh, from the Mississaugas, and he intended it to be named Toronto. However, the Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada at the time, John Simcoe, didn't like the use of Indigenous place names. 
And so he was set on renaming it York. John Simcoe specifically chose the name York, not just after the city, but in fact after the Duke of York, who was Frederick, Duke of York and Albany, the second son of George III. And we'll hear more about that etymology a little later on in our trip. It only stayed with that name for a little while, though. The people living there decided they wanted to change the name back after Simcoe was gone, and so it was renamed Toronto going forward. However, that name York still survives in a number of regional elements like North York, which was originally a separate city just north of Toronto, now just a region of the mega city of Toronto, and the various nicknames for the city. Sometimes it's called Yorktown. There's the neighborhood Yorkville. So there's a number of different references to that earlier name. By the way, Simcoe, in his uh, renaming insistence, uh, decided to change the name of the River Toronto uh, to Humber, after the Humber, the famous river um, in uh, the north of uh, England, separating uh, the basically the nor what was north of the Humber, Northumbria or Northumberland, um, from the uh, regions further south. And that name has stuck. It's still known as uh, Humber. So welcome to Reykjavik, Iceland. Uh, this is uh, the first stop on our little vacation. And I'm here, uh, my first day in Reykjavik. So I thought I'd tell you about the origin of the name Reykjavik. This is a pretty well-known one, so you may have heard it already. It means literally uh, Bay of Smoke. The first part, uh, Reykjavik, means smoke. And Vik means a bay or cove or inlet, something like that. So the name obviously refers to the volcanic steam that is produced here in Reykjavik. It's well known for it. So that uh, first element, Reykjavik, um, is cognate with reek, English word reek. And the second element may be cognate with the first part of the word Viking. Uh, depending on which etymology you prefer for the word Viking, uh, so Viking either means, refers to the, the fact that the, they came out of these bays, these fjords, unless you choose to go with the other etymology for Viking, the Vike part coming from Latin vicus, uh, meaning a settlement. So there's ongoing debate as to which of those uh, etymologies is the right one. Um, but in any case, it seems like the Vik part in Reykjavik and uh, Viking uh, may also be cognate with the, uh, the Wick uh, suffix in a lot of British place names. So we'll be looking at a few of those uh, a little later on when we uh, end up in England and look at some of those place names. Today's place name uh, is Geysir, from which we get the word Geyser. In fact, Geysir is the very first geyser. All other geysers around the world are named after this one hot spring in Iceland, located in Haukdalr near Reykjavik. So the word Geysir in Icelandic means literally gusher from uh, Geysa to gush, uh, and it comes from a Proto Indo European root that means to pour and is thus cognate with words such as English gush, as well as gut, funnel, fusion, and refund. Next, we have the place name Gulfoss a waterfall in Iceland. Uh, and the name literally means golden waterfall. Gull means gold. Uh, it's cognate with English gold, as well as the English word yellow it comes from a Proto-Indo-European root that means to shine. And foss comes from a Proto-Indo-European root that means to spray or splatter. Foss means waterfall in Icelandic, but the Proto-Indo-European root pers means to splatter or uh, spray. Next, we have the place name Thingvellir. 
Thingvellir is a national park in Iceland uh, and is the location of the very first parliament in Iceland. It's also the site of the join between the North American tectonic plate and the European tectonic plate, and they are gradually drifting apart and new land is being created as the volcanic material comes up from the ground. The name Thingvellir is, uh, has two parts to it. So the first part, Thing, refers to the fact that it was a meeting place for the parliament. So a parliamentary or an assembly of any kind uh, is known in Icelandic as thing, and originally thing meant that too in English. The root that it comes from, the Proto-Indo-European root and the Germanic after it, the word originally meant stretch, and it came to mean a stretch of time, and from that it came to mean the sort of appointed time for a meeting hence its meaning of assembly. The second part of the word, velir, originally meant a forest, a wooded area, and it comes into English as wold, which we'll see a little later on in an English place name, but it eventually, oddly enough, came to refer to an area that is sort of an open land, so that's where the, the velir part it comes to really mean something more like a field or something like that in Icelandic. Thingvellir is, in particular, the location in which the famous Law Rock is located. This is where, during the All Thing, the General Assembly, the law speaker would stand upon a particular rocky outcrop and read the laws, or speak out the laws. And in Icelandic, the word for Law Rock is Lübberg, literally Law Rock. When we arrived in England, we flew into London, and we took some footage there, but forgot to actually record the etymology itself, so I'm doing it now that I'm home. This name is recorded as far back as Roman times, when Britain was a province of the Roman Empire, and so in Latin it was known as Londinium. But of course the name doesn't come originally from Latin, it comes from a Celtic source, though we're not exactly sure what and what it originally meant. There's actually a lot of debate on this. So one theory is that it means something like place of the navigable river or unfordable river, so in reference to that point of the Thames which runs through London. So at that point uh, the Thames is quite deep, therefore you can't cross it, you can't ford it, but it is navigable by relatively large boats. So that's one theory of what the Celtic root of that name might be. Another theory is that it might be an eponym, uh, so therefore named after someone named uh, Londinos, so place belonging to Londinos. That personal name might come from uh, a word that, uh, Lond, that means wild. It may even be a pre-Celtic source that gives us the name, and I believe that's where the fordable river idea comes from. So today I'm in Leicester. The city name Leicester has two elements to it. The second part comes from the word Chester, which you find at the end of lots of city names in England, and that word comes from Latin castrum, meaning a field or camp. Ultimately it may come from a Indo-European root that means to cut, so it's a sort of cut-off area. The first part of the place name Leicester seems to refer to a tribal name. In Latin it was the Ligore. It seems to come from the name of a river, so they were the, the people who lived near the Ligore River, and that River name is also preserved in a uh, nearby river, the Lara River. According to Geoffrey of Monmouth, that name is connected to King Lear, the legendary Celtic king, and it possibly goes back to the same Proto Indo European root that gives the river name Loire in France. So that root means to lay or lie, the idea probably referring to sediment. Uh, hence a river name. So in some it means the camp of the Ligore people, the people who live near this river, the river name ultimately coming from a reference to the sediment that is deposited by the river, I suppose. So today we're in Nottingham. Uh, specifically I'm standing in front of Nottingham Castle, which is unfortunately closed at the moment. Uh, for restoration. 
but I thought I'd talk about the name Nottingham anyway. So the site, uh, before it became known as Nottingham, it was already uh, a Celtic site. So in Brythonic, and I'm going to mispronounce this name, uh, and I apologize for that, uh, it was known as Tiguo Kobauk, I think. Uh, which means city of caves. And this is demonstrated by the fact that the site that Nottingham Castle is built on is riddled with caves underneath. After the arrival of the Anglo-Saxons, the place was taken over by someone named Snot, hence the current name of the site. So it was originally Snottingham. So Snotting means the people of Snot, so his tribal group or family group. And the ham part is cognate with home, so the home of the Snottings, the home of Snot's family, or Snot's tribe, we could say. Eventually, after the Norman conquest, the S was dropped off the beginning of Snottingham, and it transformed into its current form, uh, Nottingham. So, but you can still remember that this is the place that Snot uh, owned. So here I am in Lechlade on Thames. Uh, it's a village in the Cotswolds. The village sits next to a very upper part of the Thames, and the town's name means probably river crossing near the River Leach. So the River Leach is a tributary to the Thames, and the River Leach gets its name from an Old English word, latch, that means uh, a boggy stream, and is cognate with the word leak, as in water leaking. The second part of the name Lechlade comes from Old English Yalad, which means a way, a course, or a going, and is cognate with English load. And Lechlade is the highest point in the Thames that is navigable by a relatively large sized boat or laden boat. So in times past, goods would be loaded here and shipped down to London. The Cotswolds is a bit of an uncertain etymology, at least in terms of the first part of the name. It might be a personal name, an Old English personal name, Cod, so it's Codswold, or it may come from a word that was used to refer to sheep, ultimately from a word that means a little hut or cottage that could be used to keep the sheep in, and it would therefore be related to the word cottage. Wold, or in Old English wald, means a forest or wooded area, and it ultimately is related to the second element of Thingvellir, where we were before in Iceland. So originally that the Proto-Germanic root referred to a wooded area, and then in Norse it came to instead to refer to more of a, an open valley or meadow kind of area, but in Old English it continued to refer to a forest or treed area. So it either means Cod's forest, or it means sheep forest, I suppose. The town Sirencester in the Cotswolds was originally known in Roman times as Corinium. The name seems to have come from a Celtic name. Corin is cognate with churn, the Celtic name of a nearby river, but its ultimate meaning is unknown. This, during Old English times, was then suffixed with the common place name element Cester or Chester, which ultimately comes from Latin meaning a town, a fortified place, and the first part developed into Siren, and so it's now known as Sirencester. So here I am far upstream on the River Thames, the famous river in England which runs all the way from the Cotswolds through London and out to the Channel. Uh, so I thought I'd talk about the name Thames itself. This is somewhat of a disputed etymology. This may not be much of a surprise to hear. It had previously been called Tamesis in Latin, named as far back as 51 BC. So the, the th at the beginning is not etymological. It was uh, added in later, uh, but still pronounced with a just a hard T sound. So it either comes from a Celtic root, tam, which means dark, so the, the dark one, the dark river, something like that, or it comes from a pre-Celtic root, ta, that means something like uh, to melt or flow turbidly. And by the way, in Oxfordshire, it uh, is also known as Isis. 
So today I'm in Oxford, uh, the location of Oxford University, which you can see some of behind me with uh, its many very old medieval buildings. The name uh, is pretty straightforward. It means the place where oxen ford the river, cross over the river. So it's a, it's a point where it's possible to lead your oxes across the river. So the first part of that, ox, comes from the Old English word oxa, meaning ox, probably ultimately from a Proto-Indo-European root that means wet or to sprinkle. So uh, literally then an ox is, an, is a besprinkler, an animal that sprinkles. The second part of Oxford, ford, comes from an Old English word ford, which ultimately comes from a Proto-Indo-European root pair that means to, to lead across or go across or something like that. I'm not actually in Yorkshire at the moment, uh, but we'll show some uh, pictures uh, from when we were. Uh, but in any case, the, the moors behind me may uh, uh, be reminiscent of the landscape of Yorkshire anyways. We're not far uh, from there. The name Yorkshire is actually quite a complex one to take apart. So the Shire uh, part comes from Old English Shire, referring to a administrative region. It possibly is connected to a Latin word for meaning care. But the York part is the really interesting part. It was originally known in Latin as a buracum, a Latinization of a Celtic name, possibly. So in that case, it would be a Boris's place, a Boris's farm, or something like that. Or possibly it's related to the word yew, as in yew tree. So it would therefore mean sort of a place, a, a place filled with yew trees, I suppose. After the Anglo-Saxons invaded, uh, they thought that Latinized Celtic place name Eboracum sounded a bit like a native Anglo-Saxon word, Eofor, meaning wild boar. And so they kind of reinterpreted the name as Eoforwick or Eoforwich, uh, which would therefore mean something like a wild boar farm. So the, the wick or witch part of that is a Germanic word uh, that possibly comes from, uh, is borrowed from Latin vicus, uh, meaning village, and may go back to a Proto-Indo-European root that means clan. Now after, this is the story of many invasions, after the north of England uh, was invaded by the Vikings, they again sort of reinterpreted the name somewhat, and they replaced that English place name element, uh, week, with the Norse word Vik, as in Reykjavik, which means bay, even though the town York was not anywhere close to a bay, uh, but nevertheless it sort of sounded similar enough that they made that transition. And the first part, Eofor, became simply Yor, so they called it Jorvik during the time of the Dane law, and eventually that got contracted to simply York. So today I'm in Lancashire. The name Lancashire is a, a sort of contraction of Lancastershire. So the, the first part of that, it comes from a Celtic river name, the Celtic river name Loon, that may mean healthy or pure. The caster part, as we've seen before from Latin, meaning camp. And the Shire part, which goes back to Old English, ultimately from a Proto-Germanic word that refers to a, an administrative region, but it possibly has been connected with Latin cura, so meaning care. So we're currently visiting in Bury. We're actually a little bit outside of the town uh, at the moment. Bury is a pretty straightforward one. It simply means a fortified place. It comes from a Germanic root, Old English burg, and that bury element occurs at the end of many place names in England, like Canterbury, uh, or anything with a burrow on the end. Uh, that's, that's where that comes from. It comes ultimately from a, a root that means high, so uh, it, you can imagine a sort of fortification high up on a hill or something. So we visited Manchester, obviously we're not uh, in the city right now. The name Manchester, we've seen that second part, the Chester part, a number of times already, uh, referring to a Roman uh, fortified place. The man part uh, is uh, from, from a Celtic source, obviously. Um, the meaning is uncertain, but 
it quite possibly comes from a Celtic word that means breast, in reference to the hills, so breast-shaped hills. So I suppose therefore that would mean Manchester means uh, breast hill fortified place. And one more we forgot to film while in England um, was Liverpool. Liverpool comes from Old English elements that basically means pool that is thick with mud or weeds. So the pool part is fairly obvious. The liver part is indeed related to liver, the organ, but in a different sense, uh, it meant sort of thick or coagulated. So it's obviously connected to the idea of the liver, the organ, and the body. The word also happened to be used to mean a clot of blood. And it goes back to a Proto-Indo-European root, leip, that means to stick or adhere or fat. And so hence this idea of being kind of thick or clogged up. It therefore referred to the, I guess, the Mersey, thick with, uh, with mud or something like that, or weeds. There is another theory about the etymology, that it came from something more like Elverpool in reference to eels, so a, a pool filled with eels. But I think the, uh, the consensus uh, now anyways is that it is uh, this idea of uh, a muddy water. So the people from Liverpool are often referred to as Liverpudlians. So this is a kind of humorous joke on the name, pool being replaced with puddle. Also, the people from Liverpool are known as Scousers, or their dialect of English as Scouse. This comes from an aim for a type of stew, the sort of local stew, the local dish. And so again, this is kind of humorously referred to the people and the way they speak. Well, here I am in Filey. You can see the uh, ocean behind me. And it is called Filey because of that large promontory you also see behind me. Uh, Filey uh, comes from uh, Old English fifel, meaning sea monster. And uh, the, uh, the E part of Filey comes uh, from Old English uh, A or Ia, uh, which uh, is the first element of island. There is a Another possible etymology uh, that it comes from Old English, uh, fief meaning five, and leh meaning uh, clearing, so five clearings. But I kind of like the, the sea monster promontory, and it does kind of look like a sea monster if you, uh, if you look at it. Thanks for watching and coming along virtually on our vacation to Iceland and England. If you want to hear more about uh, these trips and uh, the things that we did and learned, uh, check out our next podcast episode coming out late August. Um, main videos will return very soon. Uh, there'll be another video out later in the month and uh, lots more to come through the fall and beyond. Bye for now.